Well, I will start off with who we are, because I kind of know who you are, but I'll find out a little bit more. <clears throat> As Robert said, we are Informed Choices. We are a pregnancy medical resource center. It's been in Gilroy for 30 years. We used to be over by Westwood. We were in a couple of other areas before yeah. that. You probably know more than I do. But basically on Westwood Drive, um, right behind the dollar store almost, for many years, and they offered services to the community. Uh, they had clothing and diapers and classes for the moms and families, and uh, <clears throat> they did pregnancy tests and offered counseling as much as they could give to the families. So fast forward, we came onto the scene about five years ago and relocated behind uh, Jack in the Box right there on First and Monterey. And when we relocated with our CEO president, uh, Christine Batoni, she wanted to become medical. And medical meant we could do ultrasounds. Mm -hmm. And ultrasounds are very important because I think as most of you have already researched and learned about abortion, it really helps the mom and the families to see what's going on and helps them to bond with their baby. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, it helps them to, to see where the baby is. That's, that's our main goal. Our mission is to identify that you're pregnant, identify that that baby is in the womb, and then everything's going as planned, and then send you off to a doctor. So my job at the center is the site director. My name is Kathleen, and this is our nurse manager, Debbie, and another nurse that we have is, um, uh, hello. Is that Nancy. Funny? Nancy. <laughs> I was just thinking of something I've only known her for I was thinking years. of something Yeah, else. yeah. <laughs> no, so um, they do all the medical. So when we, we came medical, we had a license in California, which is a whole other ball game. Many of the states, because there's about 2,700 of these pregnancy centers all across the United States, but California is very rigid on licensing. So it took us quite a while, about a year, we got our license, we have a beautiful ultrasound room, ultrasound machine, they got trained, fully trained, there were, there were people in other parts of the country that don't even have any training. They got fully trained so they can identify the baby, right? And the second thing that we got to do in the last couple of years was her family was nice enough to donate a long 30-foot mobile RV that we gutted and turned it into a little mobile clinic that we're getting excited about taking around town. Because there's a lot of our clients and patients that come in, um, some of them don't have a car, some of them can't get to us. And so we want to go out and get to the people as much as we can. Kind of like what Robert was saying, he didn't know what we did. He didn't even know who we were. So if, if women and their families don't know what's available to them, uh, that's what we need to do. We need to get the word out so they can get. And our name is Informed Choices, because we want to give information so they can make a good choice. Okay? Uh, I understand that uh, some of you have been uh, studying this for a couple of months, Robert. You've been uh, looking things up online. You went to see the movie Unplanned. How is that? How did you, did you have any reactions to that? Did everybody here get to go, or most of you get to go? Mm -hmm. Was that enlightening, kind of opened your eyes a little bit to a little more information? <clears throat> that's good, that's good. Some people didn't think it was true. Oh. Mm -hmm. You can read the book also. Mm -hmm. The book is very good. There's a new book. Account. It's good. New book she's uh, putting out, she's writing right now, it's called The Walls Are Talking. And it is totally by the testimonies of people who have worked in the abortion industry, whether they were just a receptionist at the front desk or if they worked in the back room. Even doctors. Even doctors. So some of the images were computer generated, I will give you that. So that first 15 minutes of the movie looked pretty graphic and didn't look pretty real. If you're really good, you can identify that it was a computer generated situation. But even though it was computer generated, that is what happens. The baby has to get taken out of the womb in a very dramatic and violent way. And we have some models for you that you can look at later so you can actually see uh, the, the size of these babies and what they would have to go through. So it is pretty hard to watch because it, it, is, it is real. That's, that's a, it's a surgical procedure. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that you're getting all that information. So Robert asked us to come and give you more information, just in case you still had some questions. Um, one of the things I'm really passionate about um, is the whole picture of this whole, we talk about the woman coming into the center, and she comes in and she thinks she's pregnant, and then we give her the pregnancy test, and we have the ultrasound if she's you know far enough along. 
but very rarely do we see the dad. And we don't get, our clients are not just, quote, teenagers. A lot of society thinks we're getting the teenage moms. We get them anywhere from 24 to 40. 40. Mm -hmm. we, we actually don't see that many teenagers. No. It's a smaller number. Absolutely. The most common abortion uh, candidate is 24 years old. Mm -hmm. And it's between 20 and 30 is the most common age, but all the way up to 40. Mm -hmm. And definitely some teenagers, but we don't see a lot of teenagers. Yeah. So we, we see, and so you would think they're a little older, either living with someone or married, but the woman's the one who comes in. And, and I kind of feel it's unfortunate, it kind of touches my heart, that there's another person in this equation. You know, women have the right to choose, is a statement that everybody throws around. But there's another person who's getting the right to choose. And, I, and of course, I was going to tell you, I wanted to pray for someone who called me last night. A girlfriend of mine lives far away whose son just found out his ex-girlfriend is pregnant. And she doesn't want anything to do with him. And he can't talk to her, and, and she's pushing him away. And he is... is is just broken hearted. He wants to raise this child. They had been living together for a little over a year. It didn't work out for whatever reason. And he he's willing to participate. The, his parents are willing to participate. Everyone's when she's just no. So he has no right. So he's walking around heartbroken. What, what, who's helping him? And that, that really breaks my heart is that there's this other side of the coin that we just don't talk about a lot. And, and Debbie and, and another gal in our office always has this, this thing to remind ourselves, women have the right to choose, but choose what? Let's finish the sentence. They're not just choosing a sandwich. They're not just choosing a pair of shoes. What are you choosing to do? Um, so again, it goes back to our name, Informed Choices, which Nancy was very instrumental in helping us get that name because we wanted to take back that word choice. That word choice gets used in the pro-choice movement, right? Choose anything you want. It gets used in the relative movement. Everything's relative. Choose anything you want. Where's the truth that God teaches us? Where's the truth that we're supposed to be following that doesn't change? It's the truth from the beginning of time to the end of time, and it always works. But these choices people are making, they don't always work. And when they make that choice, you'll hear from Nancy, they're not happy with that choice, but now they've already made it. And now what do they do? Or maybe a young couple has made a choice in high school or, or early college to start having sex. Now they've made that choice, what do we do? You know, Debbie will speak to the fact that what's your heart? Who's protecting your heart? Great, you're on birth control or you're using condoms or whatever, but who's protecting your emotions and your heart when you cross that line and all of a sudden go into that deep relationship? That God has said it's protected. You really need to protect this. This is needs to be under the guise of, of marriage and relationship. So I just have a real heart for the other side of the coin. Um, one of the things I was reading um, yesterday is another thing I have a really hard, strong f heart for is, you know, you know there's the two types of abortions, right? Okay, cool. stop me if you don't. You've got the surgical abortion. It's farther along, and, and both of the nurses can go more into detail about that. And then there's the chemical abortion, which is you take the abortion pill. And that's become something in the last few years that makes it easy. You just go, take a pill, go home, take a few more pills, meh, baby's gone, no big deal. That's how it's touted. But I, I don't know if it, either one of you is going to speak to more of that, but the babies are pretty large. They will go up to 10 weeks. That's a large baby. That's a lot of pain, a lot of bleeding, a lot of isolation. You're sending someone home with a little bag to go home and do it on their own. And I think you saw that in the movie also, that what she went through when she did that chemical abortion. This uh, SB 24 law that they're putting in, into California now, I don't know if you've heard about it, is to allow those pills to be distributed on our college campuses. So young people, 17, 18 years old, are going away to college, maybe find themselves in a situation, afraid to tell their parents, they go in their health center, they get a little bag, they get a little pill, and off they go. And nobody's helping them. No one's with them when they go through that pain and that suffering. And, you know, almost 600 uh, women have, um, I think it's 598 women who have taken it, had to go in the hospital emergency for, for transfusions because they'd lost so much blood. Well, it just happened in Gilroy, or was it Morgan Hills? We did. Last week, because our, our um, yes, that's right. 
our admin, Tracy Schulte, her husband is a fireman, and they got a call last week, and it was a woman who was hemorrhaging after taking the abortion pill at her home. Her husband was present. She's married. She has other children. And he was just like, her husband called and said, ah, <laughs> this is what happens. So you, you'll, but you'll never hear about that. It's such a silent, quiet, I think it's all mixed in with the secret thing. So nobody talks about it. I'm quite sure that woman won't talk about it. So her friends and family won't know that that happened. Mm -hmm. So there's this um, illusion of medical safety. That's, you know, sometimes not true, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's what's really <coughs> passionate about us and many of the pregnancy uh, centers across the country. We just got back from a seven-day conference in Dallas with 1,500 other pregnancy centers. And <coughs> it's, it's empowering to know that they're out there. And they're all um, not federally funded, don't get any funding. They're all um, um, f grant funded on their own. We are totally no funding from anywhere else. We get do our own fundraising, everything we offer to the mothers and the families by the way of, of donations of, of diapers and wipes and clothing and maternity clothes and strollers and cribs all get donated to us and we give it all right back out. I don't see these abortion clinics giving anything right back out. They're literally taking an $80 prescription pill and charging $500. Go home and do your abortion, it's $500. So to me, that seems um, in, un, so unethical. If they're wanting to help women, why aren't they really helping them? They certainly don't need to charge $500 for an $80 pill. So the pregnancy centers that are out there, like I said, there's over 2,500 in the country, are willing to do all those things. We're willing to offer all those services. But it, it, we have to get, the, the word has to get out about us. It has to get known that we're there. And, and many of them are, many of the centers are Christian-based. And we do share the gospel with the, the women and, and the men or the dad, the baby daddies that come in. Always pray with them. Always offer to share the gospel with them. Always try and refer them to other churches in town if they don't belong to a church. If they have belonged to a church, maybe you should go back. Um, supporting them emotionally, physically. You know, women come in sometimes just to chat with us. Maybe they're going through their pregnancy and it's really hard. <laughs> and they just want to talk to some other gals who've gone through them. So they come in and talk. Mm -hmm. So... So that's a little bit about us, what we do, um, where we're located. You're all very, very, very much welcome to come over to our center anytime. Come through a tour, see what we do. Uh, we always need volunteers. Anyone over the age of 18 is welcome to come into our center and help us. Help us do this kind of thing. Help us go out with our mobile unit and just let people know what our services are. Help us to stuff envelopes, you know, uh, do administrative work in the office. We'd love your help any way we can get it. Who wants to go next? Anybody oh, have a Nancy. Okay, Nancy. Um, well, one of the verses in the Bible that I really um, I think of as one of my, my verses that I really love is, uh, then you will know the truth, and the truth, the truth will set you free. And that's, that's indeed true. Um, it, millions and millions of women um, have had um, have chosen abortion as a solution um, to an un unsupported pregnancy. Um, but you know, long after that, um, having that abortion, there is still the emotional, the psychological, and the spiritual um, struggles. And I can kind of attest to that. Um, you see, a long time ago, it was right after abortion became legal. I, I found myself in an unsupported pregnancy, and um, that was, I didn't know where to turn. I felt like I couldn't turn to my parents because they had voiced their, you know, concern about other uh, friends of mine that had found themselves in that position, and, and I, I just felt like I, I was so shameful and so much full of guilt. I just felt like I couldn't turn to them. The father of my baby, when he found out, he hightailed it the other way. He left me and deserted me. My friends at the time said, well, abortion is legal. Why not? It's a simple thing. Society tells you, you just go have this simple procedure and get on with your life. That's a lie. Um, because, like I said, it happened so many years ago, I have not gone one day without thinking about my son. And yes, I know, he, in my heart, I know he's a, a boy because um, God kind of placed that on my heart. 
I even named him Kevin. And I have gone through many, many years of, of um, oh, learning to forgive myself, but asking God's forgiveness and going through the healing process. It's taken a lot, a lot of years. Um, what happens with women that go through, through abortion, they will get these, the first thing they get is sort of like the guilt and the shame, but then but then they start stuffing down in them all those feelings. They just stuff them down. They, they may ha um, end up having what they call, um, they're now calling post-abortion stress. And some of the symptoms of that are anxiety, anger, irritability, uh, difficulty concentrating. They might have nightmares or sleeping disorders. They may just cry for no reason at all, just start crying. And I can tell you I've done that a lot through the years. Um, you may, you know, you have uh, recurrent kind of thoughts of your abortion and I've relived I I can relive that today and it's been so many years ago but I can remember everything that happened that day I went into the abortion clinic um, there you also get this intense grief but society tells you that okay you know they they sort of leave you let you think that you cannot grieve your child but this is a death it's like any death and as, you know, you're a mom and you lose your child. Well, if you miscarry a child, you, you're allowed to grieve that child. But if you abort your child, you're not allowed by society, really, to grieve that child. But you do, so you do it in silence. And, and that's hurtful. For many years, I did that. I remember I sat in church and wanted to crawl underneath the pew because I was afraid someone was going to know my big secret. And I was so shameful, and I felt so so bad about myself. I had such low self-esteem. I didn't care about myself. I got into bad relationships back then. Um, just, you know, over eight, did, did all kinds of stuff. People, um, other gals have, uh, that have gone through it will find themselves um, taking drugs or out drinking too much, um, being more promiscuous because they don't care about themselves. This, you know, and they don't realize that all these symptoms that they're having is related to their abortion experience. And I, um, I have found that uh, when I counsel women that come in, um, God has been great in allowing me to walk alongside these women. I just tell them what I've went through for so many years. I mean, it's been like, oh, well over 45 years, but I still think about it every day. Um, and I tell them that I don't want them to have to continue that. So we offer them at Informed Choices uh, a way for them to um, start to forgive themselves and to ask God's forgiveness and to forgive others they hold responsible for a part of their abortion. We call it SOS, which stands for Surrendering Our Secret. And that's exactly what it is. It's a secret that we, that we keep hidden. But I really felt like um, I learned that Satan want, wanted me to keep that a secret. He didn't want me to talk, but now I'm speaking out and just saying this is wrong and, and letting the, the women know, the ones that have had abortion, they can have help at our center. There's someone there to walk alongside them to help them do the healing. So we do have this, uh, this study that we do there and that they can, and we do it one-on-one -on -one or we do a group study, but we, and it, it really helps the women to be able to uh, relate to other women and realize they're not alone in this because that's one, another lie that I believed. I was all alone, even though in my head I knew there's probably other women that have had abortions, but I felt alone. And so that way they find out that they're not alone. That we, you know, every woman that um, goes, that leads that group have had an abortion. So we can tell them, hey, you're not alone. And they, they feel it. Um, but the other thing that's really great, you know, that God's used for me is now that I'm a nurse and I do the ultrasound there, um, I look at, you know, the, uh, the women, we ask them if they've ever had a, an abortion in their past. Well, I'm able to sit down and talk with them and offer them this service, or if the women are contemplating having an abortion, I'm able to tell them my story and tell them, hey, it's not one that you, it's not a decision you want to make, because it's something that you can't undo. It's always, it's always there, and the consequences of it. When I went th into the uh, abortion clinic, well, actually, I started out going into uh, Planned Parenthood, because that was all that was there back then. They didn't have any centers like ours there, so the only place I could go was Planned Parenthood. Had a pregnancy test. They said, 
It's positive. How do you feel about it? And I looked at the lady and I went, well, I'm not happy. She said, okay, here, hands me an appointment time for my abortion. That was the only counseling I got. N no one seemed to care, you know, about me. And that's what's different about our center is we don't, you know, offer or, you know, send them out for an abortion, but we're there to care for these women, to let them know that, um, you know, there's somebody that loves them and cares about them as a person. Um, yeah, and I, like Kathleen would say, it's, there's somebody else involved in the whole thing. There's always the dad, you know, or the grandparents and yeah other siblings or whatever there's always somebody else and I, I you know worry concerned about that um, my kids I have three three adult kids now because I've started becoming more outspoken and speaking out about my experience um, I had to finally tell them and it's been kind of tough and in, in fact my um, middle son um, I wanted to go see him planned with him, and he um, he said, Mom, I can't go, but he wouldn't tell me, say any more than that. Later on, he did tell me, he says, Mom, I just couldn't handle seeing that. And it was all because he knew that I had gone through that, and I think he related that to me. And I thought, well, you know, so it affects all kinds of people. It's not just the woman, but, you know, we just want to be there. The sin is just there to walk alongside these women. Um, and, and, you know, I was just thinking yesterday I had a client that came in and and um, she had had one, uh, an abortion in her past and was now pregnant again. So I offered to her, I told her, I said, you know what, you may find, and the women do find this, when they get pregnant again, then all these feelings that I listed might start coming up, things might happen, they might feel all these feelings. And um, so I told her, you know, you know, I just want to let you know we're here. If you start feeling a little anxious, little, you know, crying more, more just irritable, just some of these feelings, you can come in to our center and sit down and talk with me. We, we can get you into SOS and help you go through that because that's, women do find that once they start having kids and that all these feelings will start coming up. For me, um, like I said, I went into Planned Parenthood, and then the day that um, was my scheduled uh, abortion, my friends, I lied to my mom and dad, which I never did before in my life, but I lied and said I was out shopping, going shopping with friends. I went into this clinic, and we were lined up like, like on gurneys in the hallway. And I don't, I think they must have given us something. I, I have sort of a... And I think God does that to protect me, but I have like blanks in my memory on what everything that happened that day. But I do remember us being lined up in the hallway, and I remember talking to a gal next to me that said, you know, and I was just, uh, you know, finding out, you know, why she made that choice or whatever, and talking to her about my making that choice, excuse me. And so she, um, I, you know, I, I told her this was my first time, and it was so hard, and, and she said, well, that was her fifth abortion, mm. and I, and she just was so nonchalant, I'm thinking, how can you do this? How can you do this? And the only thing I could think of is that she probably started, you know, had really stuffed down all the feelings, and they must be coming out some way, but um, I... It took a lot of years I don't, before I remember too much about the procedure itself. In fact, it was just recently at a training we had at our center that I was uh, doing a video, showing a video on um, the different types of abortion. And he turned on the suction machine like they showed in Unplanned. And all of a sudden I could hear, I was like, it brought me right back to that day and I could hear that sound. And I had never remembered, I could never remember anything about the procedure itself. I remember the before and I remembered afterwards, but not during. And that just totally freaked me out. I thought, oh my gosh, I, I could hear that sound. And it brought me right back to that day. And, you know, I remember after the procedure, they put you in this big room with all these other people, all these other ladies. And you, and they give you, it was just very cold there. It was temperature cold, but it was also the way they treated you not caring and they I remember they gave me some orange juice and then that was it and then I was out 
you know, they did, somebody picked me up, but I was there all by myself going through that, and then began my time of stuffing all my feelings, and not caring about myself after that, thinking I wasn't worth anything. And it took a lot of years for me, like I said, for God to take me through some healing, and I am still healing, and, you know, every one of us are a work in progress. I mean, it, it'll be this side of heaven, be, you know, before I be, you know, when I get to heaven will be when I'm fully healed, but not, you know, this side of heaven. I'm still, you know, healing. But it's not, it's been an, uh, an, ex, an experience to be able to be a part of Informed Choices, but it's been, I, I thank God every day that he has, um, that he has brought me to, you know, Informed Choices and um, allowed me to work alongside women that are contemplating this, this, this choice in their life and, um, and turning my son's death into something good. And I look forward to the day. I know someday that I'm going to get to see him again. He's in heaven. And um, my husband passed away a couple years ago, and I, and I now have a vision of my husband being up there with, with uh, my son. It's not his child, but, it's, you know, but I know he, he's up there loving my son as well. So that gives me, um, just makes me feel good. It warms my heart to think about that. But uh, um, I just, I, I just have a heart for these women that are um, contemplating this because I know what it's like. And the women that have already gone through it and maybe have gone through it multiple times. And I mean, I've heard many stories from these women and it's, you know, a lot of them don't come to us, to SOS until it's been many years that they've, since their abortion. And, um, and I just think, wow, you know, all the suffering you've had to go through all these years. And I just, my heart just goes out to all these women that, and, and the guys as well, because I, I've thought about in the past, what does my, um, the father of my baby, what, did he suffer like me? You know, has he thought about it? Because, I mean, I did see him again after my abortion, and he did want to know about it, but I couldn't talk about it, and so I went, and I never saw him after that, so I wonder if he continued to think about it, and what he, you know, if he ever got a healing. Interesting point, I had to remodel it to become a medical clinic, and a lot of men came to help us, mm -hmm. much like here at your church, you know, the men come in, they take the walls down, they build the walls, they paint, they do all that stuff, and we had two men in particular that, one walked in the room immediately and was ready to start working, and then he sat down, I think he grabbed Debbie and Christine and said, I need to pray with someone. I have abortion in my past, and I need to I need to pray. I mean, he just had this overwhelming feeling. We've had two or three other men come into the building <coughs> for different reasons and have become donors and supporters of us because uh, one of them, he just, mm -hmm. he just recommended his niece have an abortion. He wasn't even involved in one except from that point, and he felt guilt from that. And he comes and volunteers with us. So, you know, God knows how soft our hearts are and what these things mean to us and how serious this is. And I think that's why it, it plays such a long-standing role in your lives when you go through something like the, that. The gentleman that Kathleen mentioned that came in and asked for, he was there to help, mm -hmm. to do some work some construction work and then he asked um, he actually asked Christine um, if he if she would pray with them and so then somebody came to my office and said oh you want to come pray with Christine and you know this this man and I'm like okay he was here doing construction so I'm not sure what we're praying about <laughs> but and I walk in and he's sitting in the chair going like this <laughs> crying that hard this big tough guy big tears rolling down his face so we prayed and the person who had had the abortion he was now married to it was before mm -hmm. they were married. They got married. They were never able to have children. So that was his only child that he aborted at, at his decision. Mm -hmm. He was the push behind that. And um, so we prayed for him and with him. And then when he was leaving, I walked him out that day to the door. And when I walked him out, he, he had stopped crying by then. But um, he looked over and he said, my child would be 24. Mm -hmm. And I could be a grandpa. And I, I felt such grief for the effects of that decision mm -hmm. in his life, you know? And he's a he's a Christian. I know he loves the Lord. I know he's been forgiven. He knows he's been forgiven. Um, he's still living with the effects, mm -hmm. you know? And so is his wife, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. You never you never forget. You absolutely never never forget your your you know, your choice. And it never goes away. And so I've talked to um, I remember talking to a gal at a health fair at Gavlin and 
and she had um, she hadn't had an abortion, but she had been there with her friend who took those pills that we were talking about, and um, her the RU486 the abortion pill, and and she said I was just trying to be a good friend and just be supportive, and I was there with her, and she said it was the worst thing she's ever seen in her life when that um, baby was aborted. I mean, you could see and you could tell that that was a baby. And she says, I'll never forget that for the rest of my life. I'll always have that image in my mind. So, you know, I, I hear the stories over and over and over again of these women, what they go through. And sometimes I talk to women that get a little upset at me for talking about abortion and, and saying that it's not a really good thing for women. It's not a, the best choice for women or, or even for families. And, and they get upset at me, and I, I just I wonder sometimes if maybe they had something in their life, mm -hmm. an abortion experience or something in their life that they haven't, haven't really dealt with. Because, you know, any time anybody would bring it up to me, I'd change, you know, talk about it, I'd change the subject, or I'd get upset, and I'd be more irritable. And, it's, and that's one of those mm -hmm. post-abortion stress syndrome, you know, kind of uh, symptoms that we end up having. And so I, I see that a lot, too. And so used to, you know, I would get upset when somebody would, like, get upset at me about you know, when I talk about it. But then I started thinking, you know what, they, I need to pray for her. I need to pray for the fact that she's got something going on and she need you know she needs help with that and so so you know I am just really really thankful that I get to be a part of this and I'm excited about the mobile unit because we're going to get to do uh, go out there and um, do ultrasounds out in the community I do everything we do in the center out in the community. Uh, the only thing I'm not going to be able to bring is like cribs and things like that. I won't have room in them. <laughs> they can come by. Yeah, but they can come by. But but we will have baby clothes. We will have maternity clothes. We will ha do the counseling with these gals. We will do ultrasound and pregnancy tests. So we'll be doing everything that they, mm -hmm. that the that our clinic does, and we'll be out there in different areas where people can't, you know, where the gals can't get to us. Even you know, we encourage guys to to come in and talk to us as well because, like we were talking about, they do need. You know, they're having some effects of this mm -hmm. whole thing, and I we get so excited, and they um, when we get to do an ultrasound, and the dad comes in, yeah, mm -hmm. and and they the dad gets so excited seeing that little one up on the screen, and and all of that, it's it just it's really pretty cool. So, um, you know, we encourage the families to come and see that to to actually like my Bible verse I told you at the beginning talks about the truth. You know, truth will set them free. That's exactly. What happens is this is part of the truth. Part of our informing them is letting them see this little life up there on the in the ultrasound, what it looks like, you know, and how big it is early on. And I got to tell you, my abortion was an early abortion. I think I was about eight weeks along. Look how it's affected me all these years. And it, and I cannot even imagine what these women that are having later abortions how that affects them. But it, early ones, it affects you as well. It really does. So thank you. Um, I guess it's my turn. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Debbie. And I have um, I have six kids. Let's hear a little about myself. My husband is a marriage family child counselor here in town. I'm 10th born in my family, so I grew up in a big family and then had a fairly big family. Um, and it's been super fun on both sides. It's been wonderful. Um, working at Informed Choices has been a really interesting thing. Um, really love for you to come visit. We love visitors. If you ever just want to walk in and say, hey, I'd like a tour, we go, yay, and we'll take you on a tour. We love it. And if you're interested in volunteering, we love that also. Um, we, we give you some training and stuff, so we don't just throw you out there and have you try to figure out what to do. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, um, there was a march in January, a Walk for Life in Washington, D.C., and I loved what they had to say. They said that we're, we're three things. We're pro-life we're pro-women and we're pro-science and it's so true it's mm -hmm. so true I thought it was so well spoken and just like um, Nancy and Kathleen were talking about we're we're so pro-women we think abortion hurts women there are a lot of feminist groups that are really anti-abortion and they're not Christian groups they just mm -hmm. see that it's hurtful to women and it really is and we are very, we're, we're pro-women, we want to help in any way we can. We don't make someone's decision for them because they have the legal right to make that decision. We don't strong arm and we don't coerce at all. We just try to give information. Mm -hmm. We're like, we're going to give you all the information that you could want. 
anything that you ask us for, we're going to give you, we're going to offer it. If you don't want it, we won't give it to you, including the ultrasound. We say we'd love to offer you an ultrasound. And if they say no thanks, we say okay. If you change your mind, come back. Almost everybody says yes, even, even women that are contemplating abortion. They usually say yes to the ultrasound. I think there's such a wonder about what's going on. And just a little, um, just as some side information, something that I hear a lot. We see a lot of ladies that have already been to Planned Parenthood. And I'm not here to bash Planned Parenthood at all. I'm, I'm pro what we do. I'm not being anti what somebody else yes. is doing, other than to tell the truth about what's happening. But um, so many of the ladies who've come in have already been there. They already had a pregnancy test. Um, some of them already had an ultrasound. And so when they come to us, and we, we do another pregnancy test because we have to know on our own unless they brought written documentation. And so then when they say, well, I already had an ultrasound, and I say, okay, but would you but you'd like another ultrasound, and she, they say yes. And I say, why, why is that? I don't mind, I'm happy. I mm -hmm. love to do it, this is my favorite thing. Mm -hmm. But, um, and, and over and over they say, well, I didn't see the ultrasound. So uh, when they do an ultrasound, the monitor, there's no, there's no monitor on the wall. The monitor that the ultrasound technician or nurse is, is seeing is turned away from the mom. And a mom recently said, I've heard this more than once, several times, she said, um, I said, can I see it? And they said, um, you can send a self-addressed envelope with a written request for the ultrasound picture in $25. And we'll send it to you, even though they're looking at it. And let me tell you, those monitors swivel. So just as easily they could have said here. So there is, you have to consider that there's a financial complication in the person that they're talking to, because they only make money off one choice. And that choice is abortion. Um, we don't make money off any choice. We make no money at all. We give freely, completely. Everything's donated. We give it back out. So when, when a woman comes in, and I like when Nancy said that she was asked, um, how do you feel about being pregnant? And she said, well, not good. And then they, they had a quick answer to that. Because I usually say when I come in with a positive pregnancy test, and I say it's positive, and there's a pregnant pause. <laughs> Funny. But, and then I say... How do you feel about that? That's always my next question. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of answers. There's a lot of tears. We always mm -hmm. say, we cry in this room. There's uh, tissues and they use them, I use them. Sometimes I cry too because there's some sad things that happen. But um, then we have a very long conversation. That's not the end of the conversation no. like it was for Nancy. That's the beginning of the conversation. And then I say, why is it, why is it not a good thing? And they tell me and I listen. And I, and I feel like, wow, yeah, that's really hard. Have you thought about adoption? Have you thought about, because sometimes they'll be like, I have to have an abortion, that's all I can do. What, I've had one woman was sitting at the, um, on the thing and we said, yeah, it's positive, she on, on the love seat. And, um, and she knew, she'd, she'd done a home test. A lot of people have already done a home test, so they really know, but they're hoping I'll give them a different answer. And so she start, she's crying so hard that she can hardly talk while she's crying. And she's like, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. That's all she could, I, we couldn't even have a conversation because she's like, I can't, I can't have this baby, I can't. And, she, and then every once in a while she'd pause along and go, my dad's sick and my, I'm working and, you know, and then more, more conversation. It was like really hard situation. And so I just let her talk, let her cry. And then we, I said, okay, well, you know, how about this thought? Oh, well, how about that thought? We give a lot of information. We have a lot of brochures, we have a lot of information about adoption, abortion, and um, choosing life. So we'll try to give you all the information we can. And so then I said, um, what about the father of the baby? All right, what, what's your relationship like? Do you see a future with him? And she says, I don't know, who can know? And she's crying so hard, she's really dramatic. I actually end up loving her so much, but she's like, how, who can know? And I said, well, how long have you guys been together? And she's like, seven years. I actually started laughing. I was like, okay, you might know. I don't know. You might know. Hey, are you talking to it? And so then I said, I said, well, I'd love to offer you an ultrasound. And she's like, okay, okay. Like, I don't know. She just didn't know anything. It was up to you. So, so we, we did an ultrasound. She saw her baby moving. She saw her baby's heart beating. And I don't, I don't push. I don't, I don't have to push. The ultrasound is so dramatic. The truth of what's going on inside is so dramatic that we don't talk women into anything. We're like, you think, you look, we, we have a monitor on the wall. 
I'm going to point out anything that you want me to point out. I'm going to answer questions that you have. Nancy's the same. Um, if they're indecisive, we're not bubbly and happy and going, oh, look at the little feet. We don't do that unless they're happy. If they're happy, then we go, look at the little feet. Let's take a picture. But um, we don't do that. If they're, being, if they're indecisive and they're scared and they're in trauma, we're just quiet. We're like, we'll, just let, we'll let the ultrasound speak and we're going to let you decide. And we're going to be here whatever your decision is. And we say that. We say if you choose um, abortion, we care just as much for you. And we hope you'll come back if you need help in any way. And they do. And sometimes we had a, a woman who came in. And it, it does happen. It's only like, I think it's like 5% of women that will choose abortion after seeing an ultrasound of their child. It's a really small number. And I see that reflected in the women we see. Um, and we had a woman that came. Pregnancy test, long conversation, ultrasound, and she chose abortion. And we find that heartbreaking. I find it personally heartbreaking. Um, I know Nancy and Kathleen do too. She came back a year later with a friend who was pregnant. Like, oh, you got to go see these guys. And she chose life. I, I think there was a big regret in her own heart, but she still felt comfortable. She felt like we wouldn't be mad. We wouldn't be judging. We wouldn't be harsh with her. And we're really, it's, it's easy for us to be loving because... It is the love of Christ that's in our hearts. We don't feel it. We don't feel judging, so we don't have to even check that. We feel concern. Once again, that abortion hurts women, so we're sad, we're sad if that's the choice. But on ultrasound, um, anybody here ever seen an ultrasound? Yeah, you. Was it pretty interesting? Yeah. One of the things we hear a lot on ultrasound when when somebody first sees the ultrasound is, um, and I try not to be the one doing all the talking at all, so I'm trying to be quiet. And um, they'll be like, oh, are those little hands? <laughs> my son, I was telling my son, Sam, about this. And he said, Mom, you should write a book and you should entitle it, Are Those Little Hands? <laughs> because it's spoken so often. Mm -hmm. And it's just when the baby is so little. We have models that we'll show you up here. Because it's very surprising how much development happens so soon. Um, a detectable heartbeat at 22 days. So... Dramatic. So think about it, because right on its own, detectable. You don't, detectable. you don't get your period. Mm -hmm. Uh oh. Yeah. So that's probably about four weeks, right? You're waiting to get your period, 28 days. Yeah. Where you don't get your period, you go, uh oh. And then you go, well, maybe I just miscounted. So you're waiting again. You made another week, and by then, it's yeah. you, you growing a living thing in you. And many, many people are still out there, drinking, smoking, whatever, thinking it's not really happening, but something is actually happening. So many, many great things are happening. Yeah. And, but so tiny, so tiny, but so so, tiny. so huge, so small and so big at the same time. <laughs> we did an ultrasound and the father, um, sometimes we, we're very happy if the father of the baby is present. Super happy. We welcome that. And um, they have different, we've had dads, uh, fathers of babies who are, you know, they're leaning like this. Uh, we had one that he started like this. And then he was leaning like this, and then he jumped up, and then he went over and hugged her. So it was like a really dramatic moment. I had one dad that was sitting like this. I mean, his body language was like a lesson in body language. He was like, I don't want to be here. I don't want this to be happening. Not one bit. And the baby measured five weeks and six days. I vividly remember this couple was so it was a big memory for me because he was a very wanting her to have an abortion, but not wanting to say it because he thought it didn't sound right to say that. So he was trying to very quietly get her to choose that by saying, whatever you want, whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, phony and chicken. But um, I didn't say those words. <laughs> I was Thank judging that. But, um, so when, when we did the ultrasound, um, and... Five weeks, six days is how big the baby measured. It's very exact. And there's the heart. And it looks like it looks like a little flicker. It's like really fast. And so I saw it. You couldn't miss it. The room was quite silent at the moment. And I said, um, there's the baby's heart beating. That I do point out. And I have a little pointer you know, on my machine that I can point to it. And so I said to him, um, I said, Thomas, um, do you see your baby's heart beating? He goes, I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> they had a little boy. They were quite happy. They ended up being very happy. But um, I see a lot of women that have big regrets about abortion. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot of women that are so thankful that they chose life. 
And I, I have to think that that's representative of the general population. Mm -hmm. um, the woman who was saying, I can't, I can't, I can't, <gasps> and we've been together for seven years, I don't know if we'll stay together. Um, she came in and brought her baby girl uh, in, mm -hmm. and I got to hold her. And she said, it was like, you know, one of those statements that you go, I will never forget the moment that you're saying this to me. She said, can you believe what I almost did? And, there, and she said, she's the best thing that ever happened to me. And she said the same, um, her parents, you know, her, her sick parent that she was so worried about the impact of her pregnancy. She said, my parents are so in love with this baby. And they tend to come around. I know a, teen, a, a young pregnancy and an, an unmarried pregnancy, you can have a mixed response from families. But I actually haven't um, yet seen a grandparent that wasn't run, won over by a grandchild. <laughs> so, you know, time is on, on the side of the... God made them really cute. Of life. Oh, yeah. Of, <laughs> Easy to love. Yeah, there's something for that. But we've seen... I saw a baby last week on ultrasound, measured 10 weeks and 4 days, definitely trying to get his thumb in his mouth. <laughs> now, a 10-week baby is about this big. If you were holding it in your hand, it's about this big. Definitely over and over. And the mother on the table said, I suck my thumb all the time when I was a baby. I'm like, well, I don't know how that's genetically. Maybe it is. But she had um, the little one kept putting thumb right up here trying to get it in. Nancy and I have both seen babies that were not quite nine weeks pregnant. The mother, not quite nine weeks. Now, when we're saying that the mother's not quite nine weeks pregnant, that's from her period. So that means the baby's been growing for seven weeks, right? We judge pregnancy from the last menstrual cycle. So it's a little bit, the baby's even younger. Mm -hmm. We've both seen babies that were not quite nine weeks moving. And it's so tiny at this point, nine weeks like this big. Super tiny. And we, we have other, we have models here. We have several models that we'll let you guys look at. One of the things, um, two things that came to my mind when I was thinking about just talking with you guys about this. First of all, I admire you guys so much. I kept thinking about the Bereans in the Bible that said that they were trying to search and talk and learn what truth is. And you see a lot of Berean bookstores, that's because of that reference in the Bible. And I was thinking that you guys are like the Bereans because you really want to know. You're not just accepting, you're thinking, you're questioning, and you really want to know. And so I admire that. And then the other thing I thought of, anybody here a vegan? Anybody here have a vegan friend? Most of us have a vegan friend. I have. Um, <laughs> She's kind of vegan. Eighty percent. Anybody? Uh, I have a. I have vegan friends, and one of the things that I hear my vegan friends say is that I don't eat anything with a face, which I think is, is dramatic. You know, what a dramatic statement. I love it, even though I like meat. So, okay. but I love that statement. But we see the face of oh, yeah. a baby on ultrasound so Absolutely. clearly. There's a face. It is not a lump of cells absolute from oh so early it, it's such a being and if you if for there's the same people that say I wouldn't eat anything with the face many of them would say it's okay to have an abortion so it's like contradictory for sure there's some contradiction there the other thing I was thinking about is um, you know there's all the question the question is when does life begin mm -hmm. that's the question oh, that science, is, part, yes. science when does life begin and I, I don't think Roe versus Wade back in 1973 would have passed if ultrasound had been around. No. Ultrasound came around, started in 1976, and it's gotten finer and finer and finer. So I don't think it would have passed then no. because the lie um, that was promoted wouldn't have worked. I, I do think that the, um, the pro-abortion industry has picked the best slogans. I'm so impressed with their slogans. A woman has the right to her own body, um, the right to choose, Every baby a wanted baby. These are slogans that resonate. People have heard them their whole lives and they sound like truth until you think more clearly and more closely. A woman has a right to her own body. The, the creature, the person, the baby growing inside the woman has a completely different DNA, has oftentimes a different blood type and definitely different fingerprints. It's different. When the baby's first moving, I can, we can see it on ultrasound before the mom can feel it because of how small the baby is. So we, baby, we see babies moving. The 10-week, the four-day baby that I saw last week was moving all over, and the mom couldn't feel it at all. And she said, oh, that's weird. It's a separate being, completely separate. Mm -hmm. So that whole idea that, uh, you know, my body, my choice, 
I think it's illogical. I think if you think more clearly, it's not very logical. Yeah. Um, and if you come from the Christmas perspective, like we do, our bodies are not our own. We all know that scripture. Our bodies mm -hmm. are not our own. They are God's, and it's not ours to do whatever we want with it. Mm -hmm. And he knew that. He knew that we're these finite, dumb yeah. little donkeys that will make the wrong choices. <laughs> You're not parents yet out here. No parents in the room, right? Um, but when you have a child, you 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 want the best for that child, mm -hmm. no matter what. I tell my daughter this all the time with her four boys. I said, you are the one person that if they come to you, you want the best for them in any situation. And God wants the best for us in any situation. Why wouldn't we listen to the person who wants the best for us? Mm -hmm. the, the, the other thing I was thinking about, mm -hmm, and we're, we're done. I'm actually done too. But the other thing I was thinking about, when we think about when does life begin, so there's a lot of discussion about that on both sides of the of the board and um, it's a personal it's a very personal call on that for yourself to decide what you think about that I mean I believe there's a right and wrong answer there but that's your you got to think through it um, John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit when his mom was six months pregnant it's a very clearly documented in the word <laughs> so that's kind of an interesting thought just just to Mung on as you're thinking about that. When does life begin? And if it begins at birth or the day before, the day before, the day before, the day before. You know, we don't. You, something to think about. Just wanted to throw that out there. Do you guys have any questions? We're, yes. we're totally done talking. Yes. You guys have been very, very, been very good. Thank you. Awesomely listening. Thank you for that. Any questions or comments? Yes. Okay, so <clears throat> I was watching a movie. I don't know. So say somebody comes into your clinic and they find out they have cancer or something really wrong with them, but they're pregnant, what would you guys tell them if they go for like an abortion or, we or would, want to get an abortion? Well, we would abortion. always, always refer them to a doctor. First yeah, of but all. Yeah. say yeah, they w want to keep the baby. Uh huh. So how would you guys like help them change their mind? Because there's this lady, she got pregnant and she didn't want to abort the baby and she had cancer. I don't know. It sounded better in my head. No. <laughs> are you thinking? Are you thinking, sweetheart? She's gonna give birth to a baby and then she may die. She'll so die because yeah, she didn't yeah. get her So treat. maybe how she shouldn't you, have this baby. Yeah. How would you like help her in mm -hmm. that situation? We help her to live in the moment that so, God gave her right now. Live in that yeah. moment. Cancer is just a diagnosis. It's not the end all. We know. Every baby. Every baby is planned. Every baby, it's not planned. Every family isn't planned. Yeah. You know, most people are out there playing around with sex, not planning sex. So, <laughs> the, the but God's planned everything, right? So we got to put that faith and that mm -hmm. trust totally, totally in the man who created us, and He can create the miracle. And if He only heals um, when the, the the woman goes to heaven and she's healed, she'll have a baby in heaven with her. Whatever that full eternity that He has for us. But yeah, it's it's a tough choice. All of these choices mm -hmm. are tough. It's pretty, un it's an unusual situation. I'm, I'm sure it's happened before. So that is a, there's some hard ones too, mm -hmm. like that, yeah. Yeah, for myself, I have thought of that just as, as a woman. If I were pregnant, if I had gotten pregnant and found out I had a disease that needed to be dealt with right then, and if I continued my pregnancy, um, I would die. I would have certainly continued my pregnancy. I just know that personally. Mm -hmm. um, tough thing. It would be a choice between one life or the other. I don't think I would win be able to make that I would let God make that choice but um, we, we don't push anybody to make any decision no. just so you know we, yeah. we're not pushing um, women yeah. that are that are contemplating abortion we, we don't push we try to help them we are our, our, saying that our mm -hmm. director Christine Batoni um, came up with is that we we hope that we can help them imagine life mm -hmm. and we would like to help them with the details of that if they choose we'd like to help them with the financial burden of it by Mm -hmm. clothe, helping clothe their baby and providing things they need. We take care of them for mm -hmm. a year after, or sometimes 18 months after the baby's born. There's other mm -hmm. agencies in town that will take care of a, a young mother from 18 to 24 years of age. If it's her first child, they will mentor you. The Santa Clara mm -hmm. Nurses Association, they'll mentor and follow you along for two years. We give a lot of referrals. So you're not stuck, yes. oh, here's your baby. No. See you later. Figure There's it out. Stuff out there. We get, I got a lot of referrals that we get, give them when we sit down and talk with them, and we encourage them to come back so that if they whatever's going on in their life, we can help them with that. And um, and I thought about that too. Like if somebody got, you know, if I got ill and was pregnant, knowing what I know now after having my abortion, I would have chosen life no matter what. And um, I mean, you know, 
back then they didn't have the ultrasound and to show me that and I believe the lies you know that was tissue um, but I, I truly in my heart believe that um, I would have made a whole different choice and even if I had some awful disease and I would make if you had some support huh? yeah if I had somebody to walk alongside me and say hey you know I'll be there with you. I'll go with you to talk to your parents. I'll, yep. you know, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll be there for you during your pregnancy, even afterwards. That's all I needed, and I there wasn't anything then, and so that that was one of the reasons that you know God kind of guided me into this whole ministry. With you know, and doing this was because I wanted to be that person for somebody else and walk alongside all of us do and but we don't I mean when I counsel a woman and I give her I tell her my story I don't stand in the doorway and prevent her from leaving because I know she's going to go out and have an abortion if I she, don't do if she said I'm if she I had a lady recently that said I'm going to have an abortion for sure we had talked uh -huh. a long time and I said okay and um gave her a hug yeah I said can I pray for you and she said yes yeah and she cried through the whole prayer and I prayed for her and she left and I said I'm going to keep praying for you and she said okay and uh, she, I prayed for her and lost tra track of her. That was in January. She came in from maternity clothes recently. And I was like, mm, thank you, God. <laughs> but she yeah. left with uh, nothing but warmth from us, even yeah. though she had said that she made that decision. We do have some literature for you guys. Yes. One of the things we didn't talk much about, but um, it's just about the choice for abstinence. I know we live in a culture that that is so unpopular. Mm -hmm. It's outrageous. But there's some literature in there about it um, and about other things, too. So... If you want to read about it, we'll give you a little little thing. And we have some other models. Oh, here's the stuff. And we have other models of babies and stuff if you want to see them also. Thank you guys so much. Mm -hmm.